Um, welcome back, everyone, uh, to the final lecture of the day. Um, our uh, speaker for uh, this session is uh, Professor Elena Nusenweg Lopez, uh, joining us from Federal University from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she's going to give us um, a bit of a pedagogical uh, introduction to convex integration as applied to fluid dynamics. I'll request members in person in the audience, as well as those attending online, if you do have questions, please reserve them to the end, and we'll go uh, through your questions then. Uh, Elena, over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I, I want to mention that um, I, uh, this talk was uh, requested, uh, a pedagogical talk about convex integration for fluid dynamics. And I am very far from being an expert on the topic. So I'll just do the best I can here uh, with, uh, with what I've got. Okay, I hope uh, you'll bear with me. Uh, I'm sure that there are uh, many more experts on the topic than, than myself. So let's go here. Um, I'm going to start with the initial value problem, just setting some notation here. So the initial value problem for the incompressible Euler equations uh, is uh, this uh, system of equations. So you have ddt of v plus v dot grad v is minus gradient of pressure, divergence v is zero, and I give you initial data v equals v naught. Okay, so this is set in R3 uh, cross time uh, up, uh, up to infinity if we could. Okay. Okay, so and V is the vector field, of course. <clears throat> so if V naught is smooth, then we have the existence of a smooth vector field up to some time, which depends on the initial data. And the earliest uh, version of this is uh, due to Lichtenstein back from the uh, late 20s, 30s, uh, up to 1930, last century. Okay, so the Euler equations are supposed to be a model for vastly different phenomena. Uh, including possibly turbulence. That will, that's what we would like. Okay, And uh, this is enough motivation to consider weak solutions. So not only smooth, classical smooth solutions, but weak solutions of the Euler equations. And <clears throat> of course, there's a connection between this and the Alexander conjecture, which I will talk about at the end of my lecture. <clears throat> and by the way, it's now a theorem. Okay, so to set things straight, the first thing I need to do is to uh, give you the def def a definition of a weak solution. So I'm going to say that a vector field which is bounded in time uh, and takes values into L2 loc. So L2 loc is square integrable, locally square integrable vector fields. In other words, finite kinet locally finite kinetic energy is a weak solution of the initial value problem if the, the following. Uh, um, identity holds true. So you transfer all of your derivatives onto your test vector field phi, uh, which means that dt of v times phi becomes v dot dt phi, plus the trace of the tensor product matrix v tensor v times the Jacobian matrix of phi, uh, plus the initial data v naught times phi of zero, if that's zero for all test vector fields, which are smooth, compactly supported in space time, and such that they are divergence free. And additionally, <clears throat> the divergence free condition is satisfied in the sense of distributions. Okay, uh, with this, it's always possible to recover a pressure as a distribution in R3 cross time up to a function of T. Now, <clears throat> an important issue aside from existence is uh, non uniqueness, it's an issue for weak solutions. Okay, so uh, the question is, is, is it, does it hold or is there a defect in the notion of weak solution that I presented above? <clears throat> okay, so uh, we're going to look at this problem in um, increasing difficulty. Uh, and first, I'm going to abandon the Euler equations and consider uh, a simpler problem. Okay, um, and then we will uh, slowly move up to the Euler equations. Uh, our objective here is to discuss in some detail 
the first construction of, of convex, the first instance of convex integration for fluid dynamics, which is the 2008-2009 result by Camilo Galelis and Laszlo Zekelihi. <clears throat> okay, so first let me give you a historical context. Uh, the earliest result on non-uniqueness is due to Sheffer from 1993, and it was followed by a construction due to Sasha Schnerman from 1995. And they observed that indeed you have a defect in the notion of weak solution because you have non-uniqueness of weak solution. Now the Schnerman construction, which is in Fourier space, uh, is based on some physical insight where the energy he forces the energy to disappear into the small into small scales using what he calls ghost forces. Okay. <clears throat> now there, there's a, pr a problem with both of these constructions because they're done in the incorrect energy space. So there's so both Sheffer and Schnurman's solutions, weak solutions, are L2 in time, L2 in space, which means that only almost everywhere are they L2. Okay, they're both in the, in the, on the torus, uh, and instead of being bounded in time, they're only L2 uh, in time, into L2. Okay. Both of them give rise, both of the constructions give rise to a solution which is compactly supported in time. Okay, so energy is not there, and then, I mean, there's no flow, and then energy bubbles up, uh, the flow bubbles up from nothing, and then it disappears again uh, after a certain time. <clears throat> so what I'm proposing to do is a tour of the method of convex integration for fluid dynamics, uh, specifically in the setting of the uh, earliest convex integration construction. All right, uh, I already mentioned that I will begin with an elementary problem and then move up to the Euler equations. And I'm going to follow a set of notes which I found on the internet, which is uh, a very, very nice uh, version of the uh, uh, Delelli's uh, Zeklihidu construction. Uh, it's called An Introduction to Convex Integration by Wojciech Ojanski. Okay, so let me consider first problem number one. Suppose you have some bounded open interval in, uh, on the, in the real line. So this is one dimensional. And I want to find a function f, which is bounded, and whose derivative is zero in the sense of distributions, and which is uh, uh, compactly supported in, in, uh, uh, in space, in, on the real line. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, uh, absolute value of f is equal to the characteristic function. Okay, so it's one on this interval j, and it's zero outside of this interval j, almost everywhere. Okay, this problem does not have a solution. Okay. Indeed, if once you're, the derivative is zero in the sense of distributions, that means that the function has to be constant. Okay, and if your function is constant, say uh, absolute value of f equals to c everywhere, but that cannot equal to the characteristic function of a bounded open interval. So this is impossible. <clears throat> the problem is, on the, uh, in one dimension, we don't have enough space to play in. Okay. Now look at the a disk, an open disk in the plane. Centered, uh, for, for simplicity, let's center it at the origin. Um, let's suppose I want to find a vector field now, which is bounded, which is divergence-free okay, in, um, <clears throat> in the sense of distributions and such that the absolute value of u is the characteristic function of this disk almost everywhere. So again, u is going to be compactly supported and one on the disk. And the absolute value of u or the norm of u, it's a vector field, the norm of u is one on the disk, okay? Here, there are infinitely many explicit solutions. So problem one in, uh, on, in one dimension had no solutions, problem two, has infinitely many explicit solutions. Namely, if you look at the vector field V of X, which is X perp over norm X times the characteristic function of D, it's easy to check that this is a solution to problem two. Okay. 
All right, um, it's a bounded solution. It's defined almost everywhere, okay? And its norm is one on the disk and zero off of the disk. And if you want to find other, yeah, I said there are infinitely many. So if you want to find other solutions, you can simply multiply this vector field by the characteristic of A minus the characteristic of B, where A and B are finite unions of disjoint annuli centered at the origin. And this always works. Okay, uh, let me give you an explicit calculation that shows that the divergence of V is zero in the sense of distributions. What does this mean? This means that if I have a vector field phi, which is smooth compactly supported in the plane, that I multiply, sorry, a vector field, no, a scalar function phi, I multiply phi by the divergence of V, and this is formal, of course, because divergence of V is only zero in, in distributions, but this means that the minus the uh, integral in the play, on the plane, of the gradient of phi dotted with V is supposed to be zero. Now this, to check, is equal to the minus gradient of phi times X perp over norm X, which is minus the limit as R goes to zero. I need to remove the singularity. So I'm gonna integrate this in D minus a little disk around the origin, okay? And, <clears throat> um, and this is equal to, you integrate by parts, the divergence of X perp over norm X, which is zero, off outside of the origin, identically zero, classically zero, okay? Minus the integral on the boundary of this annulus of phi times x perp over norm x dotted with the normal vector to this boundary. And that's zero because x perp over norm x is tangent to circles. So the discontinuity that we have is only allowed because x perp is perpendicular to the normal on the boundary of this annulus. Does this represent a defect in the notion of weak derivative? We'll see. Okay, let's look at the third problem. Now let's look at this in three dimensions. Okay, so in two dimensions, we found uh, infinitely many solutions. In one dimension, no solution. And in three dimensions, we will also find infinitely many solutions, except that it's much more difficult. Okay, so, but it's still an elementary version of. <clears throat> what happens for Euler. So suppose I have some bounded open domain, which is non-empty in three dimensions, and I want to find a vector field, which is bounded, which is divergence free in the sense of distributions, and whose norm is equal to the characteristic function or, or the indicator function of omega. <clears throat> so again, this is compactly supported. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are infinitely many solutions. However, I'm going to describe a convex integration construction of one of these solutions, one such solution. If you want to show that there are infinitely many, you need a bare category theorem proof. And the objective here is to understand the convex integration method. So the construction, the convex integration construction involves three steps. Okay. Step one is what we call the functional setup. Okay, so I'm going to introduce my function spaces. X naught is a set of vector fields which are smooth, compactly supported, who's classically divergence-free, and such that the norm of V is less than one as a vector field. So this norm of V is less than one means as a vector field. X naught will represent the set of sub-solutions to my problem. Now I take X to be the closure of X naught with respect to the weak L2 con convergence. So the weak topology of L2. L2 is square integral. So <clears throat> for any open set, I will introduce this functional IA of U, okay, where you take a vector field in X, where X is the closure of that X naught, <clears throat> So I of u is the integral on A of one minus norm u squared. And I can reformulate problem three in the following way. I want to show, I want to find a vector field in X such that I omega of u is zero. And if I do this, then I will have a solution to problem three, i.e. a divergence-free vector field whose norm is the characteristic function, the indicator function of omega. Indeed. Okay, to see that this is enough, suppose you found a vector field in X, okay, um, then necessarily because X is the closure of X naught, 
there is a sequence of vector fields in X naught, which converge weakly to you. It follows that since the, all of these vector fields in X naught are, are smooth compactly supported functions inside omega. And therefore the support of all of these ULs is going to be compactly contained in omega, which means that U is zero outside of omega, almost everywhere. <clears throat> since, since UL is divergence free, divergence free uh, classically, um, and the divergence of the linear operator, this, this, uh, qu this quality is preserved by weak convergence in D prime. So the divergence of the limit vector field, the weak limit U will also be zero. And since UL is less than one for all Ls because you're in X naught, then that implies that, that that means that UL is bounded in L infinity and therefore this is preserved again by, in, by weak convergence. So you will be bounded by one. Okay. Now, U is less than one, almost everywhere in R3. It's supported inside omega. And if I omega of U is zero, then the integral on omega, which is a non -net of a non-negative quantity here, is zero. That means that the integrand has to be zero. So U has to be equal to one, almost everywhere in omega, in the absolute value, in norm. Sorry. Okay, so... Step one was to introduce the functional setup, and then we reformulate the problem in terms of this functional setup and this, this functional I. Step two is to start adding oscillations to move to the, what I'm calling the edge of X naught or sort of an extremal of X naught. Okay, so for any V and X naught, step two is for any V and X naught and any compactly contained subdomain omega tilde, I will find a sequence of vector fields which are smooth compactly supported, just as V is, such that if I move, if I go sufficiently far, then I'm in X naught. In other words, for sufficiently large K, divergence of VK is zero, VK is smooth compactly supported, and the norm of VK is less than one. VK converges to V weak star and L infinity. In other words, it converges weakly to V. And the limit of the, the uh, uh, energy of VK is bounded be from below by the, the energy of V plus this quantity here. One of <clears throat> this in particular implies that unless I omega mm -hmm. is zero, you cannot have uh, a strong convergence because this will not converge to the norm of V. Otherwise, this will all converge to the norm of V if this quantity here is zero. Okay, before I get into that, let me give you a proof of step two. So how does this go for the, the operator divergence? So you fix V and X naught and omega tilde compactly contained in omega. You take a cutoff function, so you localize in omega tilde, Okay, so it's going to be one on omega tilde and zero uh, uh, outside of omega, and it's a function which is between zero and one. <clears throat> Choose unit vectors psi and eta, and here's the explicit construction. Vk is going to be V plus the curl of Wk, where Wk is given by, it's the vector eta over 2k, one minus V squared phi sine of kx dot psi. So here you have these fast oscillations, localized, localized. And since V is, is less than one, because V is inside X naught, this is an, a, a positive, strictly positive number times this vector field. And because we have a one over K here, this is also going to zero. Okay, it's also going to zero weekly because of the sine KX over Xi, times Xi. So this vector field satisfies all of the uh, conditions one, two, and three. Now, one of the things that I want to observe is we're using the curl here, which is sort of a freebie because we know that divergence of, of, of uh, vector field is zero if and only if, if the vector field is a curl. And for Euler, we do not have this free curl to play with. And that's one of the main difficulties. It's constructing 
uh, the, the analogous curl operator. So the final step uses three well-known facts. First of all, what I've already used basically is that if you have a weakly converging sequence in L2, that it converges strongly if and only if the norms converge. Two, <clears throat> uh, for every uh, vector field of L2 and every Friedrich modifier rho epsilon, when you take convolutions with, uh, with the vector field, you converge strongly in L2. And this is a classical fact from real analysis. Okay, you average what rho epsilon star W does is to average out oscillations and problems in W, so you get strong convergence. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and three is a little less well known, but it's also a very easy property, which is that the convolution is a compact operator. So if Wn converges weakly to W, then for every fixed epsilon, rho epsilon convolved with the omega with Wn will converge to rho epsilon convolved with W strongly in L2. And that's because what you've done is you've damped out all of you, you you've averaged out all of the oscillations. And you'll have also no concentrations. So then you have strong convergence. If you don't have oscillations or concentrations, you have strong convergence and tightness. But in a down domain, that's a, that's something uh, all is true. <clears throat> okay. So step three, you use these three well-known facts together with the previous steps to 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 get a recursive construction and convergence towards a solution. Okay, so how does the recursion go? We start with a sequence of, do of domains which are increasing, nested, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, compactly contained in omega. So the omega, our end domain, is the unit of these omega ends. In particular, the size of these omega ends converges to the size of omega. Okay. <clears throat> the the first element of our of our recursion is the vector field zero, uh, which is obviously in x naught. It's obviously less than one. It's obviously obviously divergence free, and it's obviously smooth and compactly supported. Okay, so here's a recursive procedure. For each natural number, if I assume that I have already constructed l vector fields and l minus one positive numbers. Then I will construct the L, the, 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 the next eta L, okay, such that it's less than one over two to the L, and the distance between UL that I've chosen uh, <clears throat> minus the averaged out UL in L2 is what, less than one over two to the L. So I'm using one of those well known facts that I know that as eta L goes to zero, this, uh, this object converted strongly to, to uh, UL. So I can always find <clears throat> such an eta L. <clears throat> okay. Then for this UL, I will now I will construct who is UL plus one. So <clears throat> I'm going to use step two with UL, which which uh, it belongs to X naught. I'm assuming it belongs tilde is equal to omega L, the support of UL. Okay. All right, together with the well-known facts, and I find UL plus one such that UL plus one belongs to uh, X naught. <clears throat> um, and then eta J, uh, the, the uh, average out at the scale uh, eta J of UL plus one minus the averaging out of UL at the same scale eta J, this is small ML two by one over two to the L, smaller than one over two to the L. <clears throat> And UL plus one L2 squared is greater than UL2 L2 squared plus I omega L of UL squared plus something which is little o of one. Okay, so I've used step two here. Sorry, omega tilde, uh, uh, omega L is not the support of UL, it's just my omega tilde. Okay, so <clears throat> since UL is bounded in L infinity by one, I can pass to subsequence and find a vector field which is bounded, which is L infinity, such that UL converges to U, weak star L infinity, and therefore weakly in L2. Then <clears throat> these averaged out quantities uh, will, will all, all be less than one over two to the L minus one. 
okay, for u. So this is eta L star ul minus eta L star u. And this gives me that ul actually converges strongly to u in L2. So I started with ul converging weakly, and now I'm going to get ul converging strongly because of my choice of scales eta L. So this distance can be some, can be bounded by ul minus rho, rho L uh, star u plus rho L star ul minus rho L star u plus rho L star u minus u. So it's an epsilon over three argument. And all of these go to zero. Okay, so UL converges strongly to U in L2, and UL belongs to X naught for each L. That means that U belongs to X. Once U belongs to X, I know that the norm of U is less than or equal to one, and I know that U is divergence free. So all that remains is, is to show that I omega of U is zero. Now, <clears throat> I have this basic estimate, which is controlling the error term. So this is my error. Okay, in uh, UL minus L2 squared minus UL L2 squared. If I take the limit as L goes to infinity, then what I get is on this side, on my left-hand side, I get <clears throat> UL2 squared. On my right-hand side, I get UL2 squared again. This is in a little O of one term, and I get, since omega L is converging to omega in size, I get, and, and this could, will converge to this by dominate convergence theorem, for instance, and then I get, this inequality. And that implies that I omega of u is zero, which is what we wanted. Okay. Problem three, three is an elementary context in which we applied a, a convex integration basically because, because we had a freebie, the curl operator. Now let's look at the Euler equations. So the, the uh, 2008 theorem by Delel is a Kalihi, he starts like this. Take omega, a bounded open uh, subset of R3 cross time. Then there exists a uh, V and P in L infinity, okay, which is a solution of the Euler equations in the sense of distributions. And this is equivalent to the weak formulation that I gave at the beginning of the lecture, such that the norm of V is equal to the characteristic, the, inter the indicator function of omega. In other words, it's going to be zero off of this uh, a bounded set in R3 cross time. So it's compactly supported in space and time. And the pressure is zero in the complement of omega. So this is a, a vector, a, a solution of the Euler equations, which is compactly supported in space and time. And since it's bounded uh, in space and time, it's going to be in the right, also uh, energy, the, the physical space, the right energy space. Two main proofs of this theorem were given in the original paper by, by uh, Camilo and Laszlo. One using uh, the Bayer's category theorem and the other one using convex integration. The one using the Bayer category theorem gives rise to infinitely many solutions, but we're only interested here in the uh, method of convex integration because this is what was extended later uh, to include results on, on, for the Anzagar conjecture. Okay, so this proceeds, the proof here will proceed in nine steps, differently from, the, from our elementary problem. This has nine steps. We start by reformulating the problem as a linear problem with a nonlinear constraint along the lines of Tartar's framework. So we substitute our original problem by what I'm calling problem star, which is dTV plus divergence of U plus gradient of Q is zero in D prime and divergence of V is zero also in D prime, in the sense of distributions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we, what we want is a solution to this problem, which is supported inside omega, which such that the V part, the V vector field is, has norm one, and this uh, U, which is not going to be a vector field, it's, it's actually a, a matrix, it's equal to the tensor product V tensor V minus a third V squared times the identity. And this, a very, very simple elementary calculation shows you that if, if you have this being true and V satis V U and Q satisfy this equation, then V satisfies the original Euler equations. Okay, so the, the next step is to, to uh, introduce uh, of, uh, an important subset of R8, Okay, called K, 
which consists of the V's and U's in on the sphere S2 across S03. S03 are the symmetric three by three matrices, which are trace free, such that U, is, U satisfies this nonlinear quadratic constraint. This is not a function space. This is a set of numbers. Okay, this is a set of, of uh, uh, points in R8. Then we look at the convex hull <clears throat> of this, this uh, set K. And step two is to show that this convex hull can be expressed as a set of Vs and Us who are in the uh, closed unit ball. So we go from the sphere in R3 to the closed unit ball in R3, cross S03, such that a certain function E of V and U is less than or equal to one half. This function E of V and U is given explicitly by three halves times the maximum eigenvalue of V tensor V minus U. This is symmetric matrix V tensor V minus U. It has a full set of eigenvalues, real eigenvalues, so you take the maximum of them. Okay, so you can show that E of V U is a convex function it, um, on K co, and it's always greater than or equal to the norm of V squared over two. Equality here holds if and only if U is V tensor V minus a third V squared identity. Okay, I'm not going to show these facts. I'm not even gonna discuss them. These are facts about subsets of Rn, of R8, in fact. <clears throat> um, one of the, a picture to have in mind here is that your K co, your, your K is like uh, the boundary of some kind of ellipsoid looking uh, figure in R8 and K co is basically the closure of, of the interior of this ellipsoid. <clears throat> okay, step three is just if you look at, if you define U to be the interior of my ellipsoid, uh, ellipsoid then uh, zero belongs to U. Step four is to introduce the wave cone. And I'll, I'm, here I'm always talking about subsets of Rm. Okay, so uh, lambda is going to be a subset of R9. So it's the set of VUQs such that the determinant of this weird looking matrix, U plus Q, to Q times the identity, V, V transpose zero is zero. <clears throat> so once you have, and, and this is called a wave cone, well, it's clearly a cone. You multiply this guy by any uh, real number and you still remain in lambda. And it's a wave, the wave part is because for any V, U, Q in lambda, you can find a, a non-zero eigenvector with an eigenvalue zero. And then uh, for that eigenvector, for any real valued function, H from R to R, the plane wave, VUQ times H of psi dot XT so is a solution of star. Okay, so this is our curl-like operator. Okay, this is, this is playing the role, role of that curl of WK that we had before. The only problem is that there's no way to make this compactly supported. Okay, so step five is to is localization of these plane waves. Okay, so you show that if you have somebody in lambda, which we know gives rise to a plane wave, then for every m and for every two uh, subsets omega one and omega two, one compactly contained in the other. In R4, in uh, this is XT space, there exists a dimensional constant alpha and a sequence, VM, UM, and QM, of smooth compactly supported functions in the larger space omega 2, the larger subset omega 2, such that these guys satisfy our, our, um, <clears throat> our differential equation or differential relation star. Okay, and the distance between these guys and JVUQ. So JVUQ is a line segment joining VUQ to minus VUQ, okay? So this is somebody who remains in my wave cone. JVUQ is a little part of my wave cone lambda. So the distance here, so this VUQ, VUM, UM, QM 
will be close to the wave code. Okay. It's still, it's going to be, Vm is going to be far from zero. So the integral of Vm on omega two is bounded by this constant alpha times norm V omega one. Okay. So if V is not zero, then this, this uh, Vum is not zero. And it converges weakly to zero as M goes to infinity. Okay. So these Vm, Um, Qm are smooth compactly supported functions. And they also st solve star. So this is really our curl of Wk. Okay. <clears throat> However, I'm going to need to build a different one of these in a different direction ever, at every point because of my nonlinear constraint. So I need to show that my wave cone is sufficiently large. So I show, so step six is to show that there's a constant such that for every guy who's inside the open set U, the open set U is my, the interior of that ellipsoid. So it's the interior of the convex hull of K. Okay, I can find somebody in the wave cone. So V bar U bar zero is in the wave cone such that V bar, the element in my wave cone is bounded by C one minus V star squared. And since V star, U star is in U, the particular V star is less than one. So this V bar in my wave cone is far from zero. This V bar U bar zero is not equal to zero. And V star U star plus oh, this line segment remains in my, my ellipsoid U. Again, this is, uh, this is something about R A R uh, nine. Okay, so this is this is something about in R M. This is not nothing to do with vector fields. Okay, and moreover, the distance between V star and U star. If you perturb it a little bit, you still remain far from the boundary. So you still remain. Uh, a, 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 you can you can control the distance to the boundary. To to the boundary of U, which will be K. Okay, so we recall the notation that we had before, okay, namely K is the VUs, which are uh, <clears throat> V is norm one and U is satisfies the nonlinear constraint. The, if we consider the convex hull of K and the interior of the convex hull. Step seven, now we move into uh, the, the same setup that we had uh, for the uh, elementary problem. We start with our functional setup. So X naught is a set of VUQs, which are smooth compactly supported uh, with the support contained in omega, which is my subset of space time. VUQ satisfies the differential uh, relation star. VU belongs to U, so V is less, is gonna be less than one. Q is less than one and R3 cross R. These are gonna be my sets, uh, my set of subsolutions. X is going to be the closure of X naught with respect to the weak topology as before. And then I recall step two. Okay, co was given by uh, the VUs were in the, uh, uh, the closure of the unit ball cross SO3, such that E of VU is less than or equal to half, and E of VU is greater or equal to V squared with equality if and only if VU belongs to K. Okay, and that's because if you have equality here, um, and since this is less than or equal to one half, that will force V to be, uh, v, v, norm V to be equal to one. Okay, so I'm going to use again that functional integral over a set of one minus V squared. Okay, and as in problem three, we will show, we need to, to figure out that it's enough to find a V, Q and X such that I omega V is zero, okay? Why? This is a little more complicated than before. First, we have that if V U Q is an X, then we have a sequence of uh, classical uh, smooth compactly supported function, uh, vector fields, V L, U L, Q L, <clears throat> converging to weakly to V U Q. And then the support of each one of these is con compactly contained in omega, so V is going to be zero off of omega as desired. Since v, VL, UL, QL satisfies the differential relation star, which is linear, linear, then VUQ by weak convergence satisfies the same differential relation because weak convergence 
uh, because linear differential relations survive weak convergence. <clears throat> Since VL UL be belongs to U, then VL is less than one. So norm V is less than or equal to one. Okay. And therefore, if I omega V is zero, then V is equal to one in omega. So that gives me that norm of V is going to be the indicator function of omega. And it's zero off of omega and it's one on omega. And finally, so it, once you know that V is equal to one, then I know that E of VU is gonna be greater than or equal to one half, but it's also less than or equal to one half because you're in K, in K co in particular, and therefore you VU is less or equal to one half. Therefore you have equality, which means that VU belongs to K. In particular, U is equal to, U satisfies a nonlinear constraint. Okay, so that's how you get that it's enough to show that V U Q belongs to X and I omega V is zero. Okay, step eight is to move towards the edge of X naught and add oscillations as was our step two in the elementary problem. The construction is a little more complicated because of the nonlinear constraint. Okay, so for any V U Q and X naught and any omega tilde compactly contained in omega, you have a sequence of VKs, UKs, QKs, such that they're all in X naught for sufficiently large K. They converge weakly to VUQ. And <clears throat> VK, uh, you, you control the error between the L2 norm of VK squared and the L2 norm of V squared. So the L2, it's controlled by a dimensional constant beta times one over omega tilde, I omega tilde V plus a term to what we had before, except that only, it's only a part of my, uh, uh, my vector VUQ. How do we build this VUQ, VK, UQ, Q, QK? That's the, uh, the, the, the really crucial step here. Okay. So first you, uh, you wanna fix VUQ at X naught and, and you want to let omega tilde be the support of VUQ. Okay, compactly contained in omega. Recall uh, VU uh, of X naught, uh, T naught belongs to U uh, for all X's and T's. And therefore, by continuity, you can find a small delta such that and the boundary of U is greater or equal to delta for all X naught. This is because you're gonna have uniform continuity because you're in a compact set. Fix X naught, T naught. Then because of the largeness of the wave cone step, we know that if we take V star, U star to be equal to V U at that X naught, T naught, I can find a V bar, U bar naught, which is going to depend on X naught and T naught, such that V bar naught, U bar naught zero belongs to the wave cone. And uh, uh, V bar naught is far from being zero. So it's greater or equal to C times one minus V of X naught T naught squared. And if you, if you move in, a, in the direction of V naught U bar starting from V U at X naught T naught, you remain in U in a controlled way. The distance remains con under control. Okay, now because V U is uniformly continuous, if you're sufficiently near X naught T naught, then V U of X T, if you move that in the direction of V naught, V bar naught, U, uh, U bar naught, uh, you will remain far from, from the boundary of U uniformly. Okay, so there is an epsilon here, such that if X T is, is epsilon near X naught T naught, this inequality is satisfied for the same delta and for all these epsilons. And this epsilon is uniform and independent of X naught and T naught because VU is uniformly continuous. So I can choose a finite family by compactness of two by two disjoint uh, balls, all of them having radii epsilon, such that the integral of one minus V squared um, on omega, uh, omega tilde is bounded by twice and make it a little bit bigger one, the sum of one minus V at the center of these balls squared times the size of VI. And this is pretty easy. I may have to make 
my epsilon a little bit smaller, but it's pretty easy. Okay, so for each k and each i, of which I have a finite number, I will use the localization of plane waves step with omega one is the ball bi over two. That simply means take the, the one half of the radius and omega two is the ball uh, uh, bi. So they have the same center and one of them has half the radius um, and therefore one is compactly contained in the other. So I can find for each i and q, for each k and i, I can find viks, uiks, qiks, which are compactly contained, with smooth compactly contained in a bi such that the distance between these uh, viq, viK, uik, qiks, um, <clears throat> and, and the, the line segment v bar u bar zero is less than one over k for xt in the ball bi. The integral of VIK is greater or equal to alpha times VI bar of VI over two. These VI bars are going to be uh, far from zero. Okay? And these VIKs, Q, UIKs, QIKs converge to zero weekly. So these are my little oscillations. Okay? And I add these guys to VUQ. Okay? Um, and and these, each one of these satisfies star. I forgot to write this, but each one of these satisfies the uh, uh, differential relation that I'm interested in. Since the differential relation is linear, it follows that VK, UK, QK will also satisfy the same differential relation. Okay. That's why this VK, UK, QK satisfies all the conditions. It satisfies the differential relation, it converges weekly to VUQ because these converge weekly to zero, okay? And uh, the final step, which is the error in the L2 norms, that is, that's obtained by putting together all of these different error constructions that we did. Okay, step nine is the recursive construction and convergence towards a solution, and that follows strictly the same structure as in the proof of step nine, uh, of uh, proof of step three, sorry. This is a typo. Proof of step three uh, in problem three, okay? So the, the critical thing is you want to start from zero, which is an X naught, and follow exactly the same recursion using step eight above together with the same well-known facts. Okay, so this is how the uh, original construction by the Lalevisic Lihidi goes uh, actually, this is a version coming from their second paper, which is the uh, admissibility con conditions paper. <clears throat> now, since the 2008 paper by uh, Camilo and Laszlo, convex integration method has been used in many other fluids problems. For instance, compressible Euler equations, isotropic gas dynamics, porous media, incompressible MHD, active scalar equations such as SQG, even Navier-Stokes. Most of the research, especially the, the subsequent research after, uh, immediately after the 2008 paper, was concentrated around the Anzaver conjecture, which, is, which gives a threshold of regularity for conservation of energy. So in 1949, Anzaver conjectured in, a, in, a, in this uh, Novo Cimento paper that's very famous, that if you have a, a vector field which is bounded in time and holder continuous in space, and it's a weak solution of the Euler equations, then if it's holder continuous with exponent greater than a third, then it will conserve energy. And if it's less than a third, then you can find a, such a weak solution which does not conserve energy. <clears throat> Why is a third a, the, the correct critical threshold? And this is basically due to dimensional analysis because the energy at time t, which is given by one half the integral of the uh, square of the velocity, since the, uh, we're assuming always that the uh, density is one, then the rate of dissipation of this energy is minus the integral of v times v dot grad v, this trilinear term. Okay. Now this is a an exact derivative. It's the derivative divergence of v times one half of norm of v squared. Okay. Uh, if you have a sufficient smoothness. And this object, divergence of v times one half of v squared, is dimensionally equal to the uh, the dimension of velocity cubed over uh, space l. 
Okay, so clearly, if u cubed goes like l to if u goes like l to a third, then this is a term of f order capital O of one. Okay, anomalous dissipation, as we all know, is a cornerstone of turbulence theory. In viscid fluid flows that do not concern, do not are not expected to conserve energy for turbulence, the energy dissipation rate should not vanish. <clears throat> um, and this uh, this idea then led to this flurry of activity uh, around anomalous dissipation and construction of such wild solutions, of which I exhibited one example so far um, <clears throat> for Euler. The earliest example, earliest examples, as I mentioned, were due to Sheffer and Schnurman, and then this construction due to Camille and Laszlo from 2008, published in 2009, and they gave, they were concentrated first on the issue of non-uniqueness, compact support in space and time, with a time-dependent energy. And the de la Cicli-Hedy construction is introduced the method of convex integration. There, there were a number of different papers between 2009 and 2013 uh, from the uh, L infinity construction, followed a continuous con construction, from that followed a Holder continuous construction with Holder exponent one over 10. Then in a breakthrough result from 2013, Phil Izet produced a vector field which was continuous with Holder exponent up uh, slightly less than one over five, one fifth. And Buckmaster, Delelis, Isaac, and Zekehidi uh, uh, improved this construction uh, to uh, prescribe energy in 2015. In 2016, there was another breakthrough, breakthrough in that Tristan, Camillo, and Laszlo produced a, a, a weak solution of the order equations, which almost everywhere was in time, was in the right uh, uh, threshold space, C one third one minus epsilon. And these are all three-dimensional constructions. And we did notice already that having enough space is crucial here. Uh, in uh, two, in uh, 2013, Antoine Chouffreau produced a, a construction which works in two dimensions and leads to a solution, a weak solution in C110. And finally, in 2018, Phil Isette established as a theorem the Anzara conjecture, the flexible side, uh, which is to produce a solution which is uh, C one third minus epsilon compactly supported in time. So it's continuous in time, C a third minus epsilon in space. This was improved uh, in 2019 by Tristan Buckmaster, Camilo Delelis, Lazlo Zaglihidi, and Vlad Vicol, uh, where they managed to prescribe the energy profile. So for any prescribed energy profile, there is a weak solution with this regularity in, in uh, space at C a third minus epsilon. Um, and uh, um, it has that energy profile as energy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these subsequent uh, and convex integration, uh, th these were all convex integration um, uh, proofs, not bare category proofs. They were all convex integration proofs. And um, they started to incorporate dynamics. So this is a crucial difference between the first construction that I showed you, which has no dynamics in it, and the subsequent constructions where you started to use actual solutions like the Beltrami flows and eventually the Mikado flows. Okay, in 2019, Tristan Buckmaster and Vlad Foucault used convex integration to produce a viscous flow with a prescribed energy profile. And they show that there is, that, that there is an inviscid limit with anomalous dissipation. This is an inherently, inherently three-dimensional construction. Okay, uh, Brian Colombo used convex integration to establish non-uniqueness of 2D Euler with a vorticity, con con uh, 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 vorticity controlled in weak L L1. So this is L1 common fit infinity. This is weak L1. Um, this is a very interesting result because it's the first result where you have any kind of uh, almost integrability control on vorticity in 2D, but it's very, very weak. And finally, um, all, all, Dallas Alberton, Elia Bray, and Maria Colombo in last year, uh, actually the year before last at this point, showed non uniqueness of Luray Hopfleet solutions for Never Stokes, but this is a not a convex integration uh, result. On the uh, other side, the conservation of energy, 
the rigidity, what we call the rigidity side, the earliest result was due to Frisch and Salem from 1975, which is H5 over 6 in space. Then you have conservation of energy. And A Inc. in 1994, and then uh, Constantine TD 1994, uh, established that if you have a weak solution of the 3D order equations, which is L3 in time, and in this Bezov space, which is very, very close to be C one third, a little bit big, bigger than C a third, then you have conservation of energy. The state of the art result is due to Sheskinov Constantin Friedlander Schwitkoi from 2008, and it's L3 in time, B a third, 3C0, which means that the little wind Paley components uh, vanish as uh, the frequency goes to zero. Goes to infinity, sorry. This is a 3D and a 2D construction. There is a 2D result due to Duchamp Robert that says that if the initial vorticity is in LP for P greater than three halves, then this implies conservation of energy. And you extend, can extend this all the way up to P equal three halves using the uh, Cheskinov constant free letter Schwitkoi result because W13 halves belongs, is, is a subset of this L3T B a third 3C0 space. All of these constructions involve studying optimal conditions for the energy flux to vanish, and they are all within this uh, uh, dimensional uh, scaling result that I mentioned. Okay, so I, I'm going to close here, and I will talk more about the two-dimensional case, including uh, regularity thresholds for energy balanced and force flows next week. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Uh, Elena, I have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, this this may be a not a well-formed question, but the form of the nonlinear term uh, seems important to the construction of that uh, cone, uh, K cone, that it actually could be translated into this eigenvalue of a, a symmetric matrix, right? Yeah. Is that a necessary part of uh, the whole convex integration scheme as applied to even all the other examples that you talked about? Okay. Um, so the wave cone is tied to the differential operator, obviously. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I want to emphasize, I'm, I'm very far from an expert on convex integration. Very far. Okay. Um, I don't know, but I do believe that, uh, I mean, this is the, the, the main challenge in using this construction for other differential operators is exactly that. It's finding the right wave cone, making sure that it's large enough. We tried to do this for MHD and we were unsuccessful, for instance. Right, right. So that was actually going to be my sort of follow-up question as to, uh, you know, if I wanted to apply this to a different kind of nonlinear term, uh, this is yeah. the essential it, challenge. Is yes. Is, is, is there a way to interpret some of the uh, these oscillating sequences as kinds of solutions, or do they represent something physically that might give us some intuition about how to do these constructions? Okay, so that that's another main point was that this original construction had no dynamics. the The constructions that were made uh, following up on this construction incorporated dynamics, which means that they actually worked with solutions such as the Beltrami flows. Right. Okay. right. So you had to incorporate the dynamics into, into the picture. Right, right, okay, all right. Uh, any other questions? These oscillations, no. These oscillations uh, are not physical. They're, they're not physically uh, uh, motivated. They're really ad hoc. I see, I see. I mean, I, I think that, that itself would form a challenge in sort of extending these results, right? I mean, the, the, the construction is uh, quite particular. Uh, yeah. Specific choices that are made, uh, and applying it to other problems means you have to understand how to make those constructions. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, this construction, I mean, it, it begs the question of you know, how physical is is the solution, and there, as far as I can tell, there's no reason for it to be physical at all. It's it's a very ad hoc construction. It highlights basically the defect in the notion of weak solution. Yeah, go 
Can I uh, compare, give an analogy with the practical design problem? Uh, can this be considered as a reverse inverse design problem? We normally in design, we start with the construction and try to get some performance. So otherwise, or even uh, uh, aerodynamics, we start with uh, uh, some parameters and uh, some design geometry and then try to get the required uh, flow field. So otherwise, uh, there can be, one can start with a flow field, known flow field and try to generate the design. Is there any analogy between what uh, you have been discussing and uh, this issue? I Practical do not know. I would problem. not believe so. I would not believe so, but I don't know. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Please go ahead. Sure. Yes. Hi, John. Uh, hello. Hello, Helena. Um, I only came in late into your talk because I was traveling into London. Um, going back to the physicality of these wild solutions, you know, the history of physics is littered with examples of people who produce strange special solutions and everybody wave them aside. And then years later, suddenly somebody observes something like them in an experiment. It wouldn't surprise me if somehow or another, the, the, they were physical, maybe in strange cases, but I, I would be surprised if they were not physical. Let's put it that way, under certain special circumstances. Okay. Um, yeah, I would be surprised if they were, but okay. Because it, it, it's a very ad hoc construction. Of course. But, you know, like I say, when, when the basic okay. equation of motion have a solution, then usually that means something. Um, so, well, yes, well, time will tell, of course, but I'm okay. just making, I'm just putting that remark out there. Okay. I look forward to your next lecture. Uh, <laughs> it will not be about complex integration. No, no, that's okay. If I can make a comment, I mean, uh... If you have some equation and you get some solution, ah. uh, of course, it can be a solution, provided all the laws of phys physics and mathematics are uh, followed uh, in uh, uh, truthfully. Otherwise, it can be a spurious solution. It may not exist. I don't know whether anyone would, one would like to make a comment on that. I, um, sorry, I could barely hear you. Okay. I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, what, what I meant was, if there is any equation, whether whatever be the equation, a uh, partial differential equation or any equation, and if you get some solution, and to say that uh, it is a, it, there should exist a solution, then uh, the solution can exist only if uh, the laws of physics and mathematics are followed while getting that solution. Otherwise, it can be a spurious solution and uh, it may not exist. Uh, look, you, you have solutions of never Stokes in order which grow at infinity and that's, that's not expected and that's not physical, for instance. So if, if... Grow literally at infinity. Yes, that is what I meant. I mean, the solution can become solution can become physical only if the laws of physics and fun, fundamental laws of physics and mathematics are followed truthfully. Otherwise, uh, it can be a spurious solution. Yeah, I mean that that's sort of my feeling. Well, well, yeah, you know, one thing that I'm calling a physical solution is something which is a limit of of never Stokes. That that's that's one way of of defining a physical solution. Is a, as a limit of uh, solutions of never Stokes uh, satisfying the energy inequality. So the Ray Hopfleet solutions, and that's not been shown to to be the case yet. So the best that you have are uh, these uh, uh, illicit limits of these non Ray Hop solutions, uh, while solutions that uh, Tristan and Vlad constructed, the, the Buckmaster Vickle. I I mean uh, I don't know whether the Navier-Stokes solution. Uh... Original Navier-Stokes equations can be solved uh, 
completely truthfully without uh, using some numerical analysis or assumptions or whatever we do in various uh, modeling, numerical and uh, um, other physical modeling. Can your uh, navier Stokes equations be solved uh, uh, for all flows? I mean, uh, for some flows, it may be possible if you make all assumptions. Uh, uh, assumptions. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm talking about weak solutions. In general case, yes. uh, navier Stokes equations can be solved. Yeah, that is a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, any any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Elena for another wonderful talk. And once again, and we'll see. Uh, we'll meet, I guess, tomorrow.